Speak into it. <laughs> okay. I'm Chuck Gunderson. I am the former owner of the Tigo General Store in South Pomfret. And now I'm a sporadic columnist for the Vermont Standard, which seems to be enough of a literary connection that I get asked every year to introduce an author. And I was offered two this year, and I chose Geza as the more interesting of the two. Um, and interesting is not the correct word. It's more like fascinating. Um, so I'm going to read um, the little script here that they've given me so that you know who is responsible for all this. And then I'm just going to turn it over to Geza because I'm sure you're here because you know his bio pretty well uh, as well. So Bookstock is totally volunteer run and free to the public. Bookstock is supported in part by the following organizations whose generosity has made it possible to offer Bookstock without charge. The Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Pauline Davenport Children's Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, the Woodstock Learning Lab, and a special thanks to our media sponsor, the Vermont Standard, WCTV8 Woodstock Community Television for taping all of the sessions, Vermont's oldest independent bookstore, the Yankee Bookshop, and Sustainable Woodstock. We operate on grants, local generosity, and donations. So please, if you can, drop something in the donation containers as you leave. It will be greatly appreciated. So I'm going to just turn you over to Geza, and he will speak for a while, and then a little time for questions and answers. And then afterwards, he'll be available for signing books and conversation down below. So, Geza. Thank you. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Thank you, Chuck, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming out on such a hot day. And uh, special thanks to Bookstock and the Bookstock team for arranging this uh, wonderful venue for me to talk in, uh, and to the St. James Episcopal Church for hosting it. So the book I would like to talk to you about today is The Fencers. It, this was published by Devoilier Publishing in March and I'm happy to say it has been receiving a good reception. This is the story of uh, Paul Sabo, a Romanian-Hungarian fencer who approached me at the Montreal 1976 Olympic Games to help him defect to Canada. And it is the third of what I call my Cold War escape trilogy, a trilogy of memoirs. The first of these, For the Children, was the story of my own family's escape from Hungary in 1956 during the revolution and uh, immigration to Canada. And the second uh, uh, memoir is the story of three Czechoslovak girls who similarly approached me at the World's Fair in Osaka, Japan, Expo 70 in 1970, when I was 21, to help them defect to Canada. So these are three stories that all have to do with uh, getting away from uh, the, the former communist world, what is now the former communist world, to a better place to live and start a new life. The Fencers, though, is not um, only an escape memoir, but it is also a sports memoir and very much an Olympic one. It um, chronicles my fencing career, starting in high school in Toronto and then continuing at Harvard and Oxford and London and um, competing internationally for Canada while I was in Europe um, and ending up with the Olympic Games in 1976. The book also doesn't just uh, focus on fencing, that might be a little boring for everybody, but I, I also try to work in some of the thrill of being at the Olympics and some of the other events like uh, the modern pentathlon, the track and field, and of course gymnastics with Nadia Kumanich and the closing and opening ceremonies which were quite big events in and of them themselves. So Paul Sabo and I fenced together in the Olympics, although we had come to know each other on the international circuit before. Paul represented Romania, although he was a member of the 
big Hungarian uh, minor minority in that country, which was very much discriminated against under Ceausescu, Stalinist Ceausescu. Is that better? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for, t for telling me. Did, did, should I go back a bit or did you? No? Okay. okay. Um, so he, he was fencing for, for, for Romania and I was fencing for Canada. Um, and uh, since I spoke Hungarian and he was of the Hungarian minority, it was natural that we would become friends. Um, we were pursuing fencing and met up at a number of international competitions. So I will read an account of one of our early meetings, and this is at Heidenheim in Germany, which hosts the largest EPE competition in the world, even to this day. Uh, countries can send uh, as, many as, um, as many fences as they want to that competition, whereas in the Olympics it's only three or four. Um, and uh, the year is 1975, and uh, I had just been eliminated from the combination, competition through some blatant cheating, but I'll let you read about that in the book. <laughs> Um, and uh, this takes place. Okay, here we are. I threw my bag in the corner and sat down on the bench. I buried my face in my hands. It was only when I looked up that I noticed two Romanian fencers, Popa and Dutu, sitting across from me, shoveling sp some spam-like food into their mouth from plastic containers. Just then, Paul Sabo, the tall, lanky Hungarian-Romanian fencer, whom I had seen and said hello to at other competitions, came into the dressing room. He had been fencing in another pool on the piece beside me. See ya, Paul greeted me with the Hungarian slang hello as soon as he saw me. He had pointedly come over to sit beside me as opposed to with his Romanian teammates. How are you doing? He must have seen the dejected look on my face. Did you go through? No. And you? Okay, I made it to the next round. Congratulations. Just then, Yorgu yelled something to Paul that I didn't understand in Romanian. He gave a curt answer back before turning to me and asking, Geza, do you want to buy some, some blades? Yorgu wants to know. He will sell them cheap. It was well known in fencing circles that many Eastern European fencers sold state-issued equipment for hard currency, for pocket money, mainly to buy blue jeans and other Western fashionable clothing, as well as electronic gadgets. No thanks, not now. I was not in the mood, just very angry for having been cheated out of going into the next round. Besides, I would not need any epee blades anymore if I quit fencing, which at that very minute I was seriously considering doing. Paul relayed the message to his compatriot across the dressing room. An answer came back. I didn't give a damn. I just wished they would all go away. Jorgu says he will sell them to you very cheap. And the Romanian fencer across the way took a uh, batch of 10 or so brand new epee blades out of the fencing bag and waved them at me. He says he needs the money. He spent, he spent the five dollars our presentation, our federation gives each one of us last night and this morning and would like to have some money for a warm meal tonight, Paul continued, a bit embarrassed. Not a bad idea. I would too come to think of it, he added, almost as an afterthought. What do you mean, I asked, puzzled. We only eat the food we bring from home so we can spend the little hard currency they give us on jeans and other stuff to take back. The two over there, they are hungry after fencing and now they are eating the last of the food they brought from Romania. My stores are pretty well gone too. I bought Yorgu's ten blades and did not even haggle. And I gave Paul the sandwich I had made for myself at breakfast in the hotel, plus the apple I had taken for a snack. I had been cheated out of a better placement in the competition but these poor Romanian fencers were suffering a much greater injustice. They were being cheated out of their dignity. Can you hear me now? Is, is it okay? No. no. Should I try this one? Okay. Is there something we can do? Hello? Hello? Better? I'll try. Speak loud. Yes. So with all this international experience and good coaching by an excellent Hungarian coach at Oxford and London, I came first at the 1976 Canadian National Championships and was elated to make the Canadian Olympic team. 
But I met Paul again at a few other international games before, competitions before the games. And then finally it was time for the Canadian team to move into the Olympic Village and start getting accustomed to the venue. And this takes place. We were not the only team to come early. Already on the first day, all of us assembled in Montreal. After moving into our rooms, we went over to the Winter Stadium for an intensive training session. As we entered the huge hall that had been impressively set up with 12 fencing pieces dotted around on the floor, I immediately noticed that a couple of teams were already there practicing, also getting used to the venue. By the piece in the far corner, I recognized Yorgu, the Romanian fencer, standing beside a squat little man dressed in a warm-up suit watching two du dueling athletes. When they stopped fencing and took off their masks, I saw that one of them was my friend Paul Sabo. I was glad he was there because I was quite fond of him. I wandered over to where the Romanians also seemed to be taking a break. I asked Paul if we might engage in a practice bout or two. I was very familiar with the styles of my two epee teammates and was glad to have someone new to fence against in training. After three bouts, all three of which Paul won quite handily, we decided to have a break and chatted. Paul led me out of earshot of his teammates, coaches, and the inevitable minders who were lazing around. We exchanged the usual super superficial pleasantries, and since I saw that my teammates were starting to pack up to go to the showers, I was about to take my leave when Paul inquired, somewhat nervously, Geza, I wanted to ask, would you know an address where I could have some money sent? And glancing in the direction of the piece where his compatriots were, he continued, a safe address. Friends of my family who live in New York said they would send me some dollars. I did not ask why, but I was sure that the Romanian athletes were allowed only a very little pocket money, perhaps for the Olympics more than the five dollars they had been given to go to the Heidenheimer Pokal, but still, if anything, it would no doubt be a laughable amount. Of course, Paul, you can have them send it to me, care of my grandmother. She lives with my aunt in Dollar des Ormeaux, a suburb of Montreal. I was glad to be able to help, so I tore a corner of a score sheet that was on one of the tables and wrote down my aunt's address. Here, just have them mail it here, to this address. Paul and I saw each other several times at the Olympics, either in the village or at the stadium, and certainly during the tense days of the competition, we, we were both there to fence. But the cafeteria in the village was the meeting point for athletes. And towards the end of the games, after my event was unfortunately over for me, I went there for a meal. And this happens. My friend Paul Sabo signaled to me as soon as he saw me enter the dining room. He was alone by a window at a two-seater table with just an empty glass in front of him. I went right over to join him. Hiya, I see neither of us fenced well today. I greeted him, having decided to put a jolly face on the matter. Yes, Paul seemed agitated. Let me just get some food. No, no, but Geza, can we go for a walk? I, no, please, Geza, I want to talk to you. Not in here, though. Paul, I wanted to tell you, the money still has not come. Come, let's go outside. The information did not seem to register with my friend. Once out of the cafeteria, Paul grabbed my elbow. Here, this way, let's go over there. He pointed to a small grassy knoll to our left, back behind there. I followed him. His long legs were moving fast as he glanced from side to side, scanning his surroundings. Paul, what's going on? Here, let's sit over there. Paul climbed up the rise and then sat down the other side, a bit out of sight of most of the action in the village, and stretched his six feet three inches out on the grass. I want to stay. When somewhat puzzled by what he might have meant, I did not answer. My friend continued. After the Olympics, I want to stay here in Canada. You mean defect? The enormity of what he was saying took me by surprise. Yes, I do not want to go back to Romania. Paul, are you sure? I still could not believe my ears. Yes, I have made my mind up. I want to stay here. 
But for Paul, this was a difficult decision. And he went back and forth on it several times until the very last moment. The games, though, with all their splendor, were going on in the background. And for many of us who had finished our events, it was turning into one big party. Toward the second last day of the Olympics, this is what happens. The next morning, I was a little hungover, but after a quick shower, hurried to go down to the cafeteria. It was a beautiful Montreal su summer morning. The sun was blazing, and there was not a cloud in the sky. Paul was already sitting there in his usual spot by the floor to ceiling window. He looked like I felt. Sorry I could not get away yesterday. Too bad. I had Carla, the gorgeous volleyball player, lined up for you. Could they send me back? Paul's mind was obviously somewhere else. Yes, maybe, but not likely. I switched into defection mode. And then, if they do? Well, they may give you a hard time. As far as I know, the Czechoslovak girls I tried to help in Japan, who went back, were not able to continue their studies or else lost their jobs. No. Paul, you were also in the army, weren't you? Yes, I was a sergeant major. They may say you tried to desert. I could be court-martialed. Desertion is serious in Romania. Phew, Paul, that's not good. I was starting to get concerned. This put matters into a different league. I could be shot. Don't, don't, don't worry, you will not be handed back. I was trying to convince myself, too. Are you sure? Paul, we will leave tomorrow. Better to focus on mo moving forward, I told myself. Meet me here at 9. I'm not sure. It's too risky. Not just for me. For my parents, too. I don't know what will happen to them, or to me. Paul, yes, it seems dangerous now, but probably a lot more than it really is. What do you mean? For sure, if you do succeed, you will have a much better life. Concentrate on what he will gain by staying, I told myself. And you will be able to help your parents. Send them money. You will forget about how risky it was. Don't be stupid. I won't be able to contact them for years, if ever. Well, you have to make your mind up by tomorrow. My headache was getting worse. I was starting to lose heart, too. It all seemed to be coming apart right at the last minute. We have run out of time, Paul. If you want to stay, I will help you. I'm not sure, Paul looked out the window to avert my eyes. I will come back here at 9 tomorrow morning, and we will drive away if you want. If not, we will just say goodbye. Part as good friends. How about it? We had to shit or get off the pot, as my friends in college used to say. No more vacillation, undecidedness. OK. So that was the day of the um, exciting closing ceremonies that some of you may have seen on TV or remember. Um, for us, all, all the Olympians, though, as I mentioned, uh, even that turned into a big party, except, of course, for Paul, who was uh, still going through the deliberations. This was ne the next morning, and this is the last bit I will read, this is what happens. The next morning, as I slowly came to, I knew I, I did not want to get out of bed. But fortunately, through the haze, I remembered my promise to Paul. And even though I felt terrible and tried unsuccess unsuccessfully to kill my headache with a double dose of aspirin, I struggled into the shower at quarter to nine. I cursed myself for setting such an early rendezvous with my Romanian-Hungarian friend. He was there already at his usual table, very agitated and visibly gray with stress. Clearly, he had not slept a wing and had just a glass of orange juice in front of him. I passed by the food line without taking anything, indeed looking the other way for fear of throwing up, and went straight to his table. Good morning, Paul. So what's the decision? We were a fine pair to carry out a defection. I cannot do it, Geza. I would just be too selfish, and it would be risky. My parents. I could not face a court martial. This was sort of what I had expected on the way over. The cards had been stacked against it from the start, really, when I thought about it. And even more so now that the Romanian minders were all over their athletes because of the two members of their team 
who had defected. Fine, Paul, that's okay. But then maybe I will just go back to bed if you don't mind. Before we say goodbye, Geza, let's go for a walk. Just one more time. Sure, I owe that much to my tormented friend. But I would much, have much rather been back under the sheets. We walked in silence until we were on the path that led by our grassy knoll. Okay, Geza, let, tell me what happens. What will happen if I stay? I want to know. Paul, we have talked about this. I cannot give you any certainties. I was losing my patience. My head was still throbbing. My stomach was churning. I needed to close my eyes. I can only tell you that I can take you to see the Canadian immigration people in Ottawa tomorrow. There are, I think, likely to let you stay. But I cannot give you a guarantee. And will I be able to go to university? He was again jumping ahead. With hard work, probably. Yes, again, no guarantees. Several steps in silence. My poor mother, I will never see her again. And my father. Yes, it will not be easy for them, but the difficult times will pass. Maybe in a few years they can come to visit, or you will be able to go back. You will just have to be strong, and I will help. So will my family and friends. That is all I can offer, Paul. I'm being totally honest with you. All right, all right then, Geza. I will stay, but I want to go right now. Was this a decision? or just another swing of the pendulum. So I think that's all I'd like to read from the book uh, for you. I don't want to spoil any of the story. Um, I think I've given it away already quite a bit. Uh, but I'm happy to answer questions. And if you'd like to discuss certain things, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Yes. No, in, in short, I'll tell you. Uh, my f uh, f uncle, my father's brother, was already in Canada. He had uh, uh, left after the uh, Second World War. Again, it was a very harrowing escape. Uh, uh, I won't go, won't, won't go into it. Um, but since he was there, it was obviously that that's where my parents wanted to go. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, getting out of Hungary was not easy. It, we were captured twice. The third time we got out, we had some relatives in Vienna who helped us. And uh, then uh, my father uh, uh, applied, obviously, to the Canadian immigration people. Again, that's a long, that takes up a good bit of the book for the children. Uh, and ev eventually, we, we were uh, accepted to go there. And, uh, and my parent, my mother, uh, passed away fairly young. But my father. Uh, lived there till uh, he was 89 and, and passed away in, 80, in 2011. And my sister still, I have a sister who still lives there. So Canada sort of the new home for the family. What, what month did you come out with? It was December. So okay. it was the middle of the winter. Yeah. December or November? Because the, the revolution, um, you may, may know, uh, was in October, towards the end of October. And the Hungarian revolutionaries managed to kick the Soviets out for, uh, I think, six or seven days uh, before they came back in with uh, lots of tanks and aerial bombardment uh, uh, to put down the revolution. But uh, pockets still kept on fighting right through to December. And the, the borders were actually uh, st starting to be closed uh, already in, uh, in November. So we, we were looking for places that were still open. There was some intelligence around. And we, um, it's one of the places uh, where we tried, uh, actually, it had just been the border patrol had just been strengthened. And uh, we walked right into the hands of the border patrol. Did you cross at night? Yeah. yeah. And how did you get to the end? I, I know a lot about it. That's why I'm asking. Uh, well, we uh, uh, got to Vienna. We were first put into a. Uh, uh, refugee logger, a refugee camp, uh, and uh, when we arrived in Deutschkoch, which is a v village right across uh, from Hungary, and my father called up his cousin, who had also somehow gotten out between uh, the end of the war and uh, 
56, uh, and uh, he was uh, in business in, in uh, Vienna, and he sent down a friend of his to pick us up in a car. So that's how we got to Vienna, and then we stayed with some other relatives and eventually went into a, a camp for refugees at the airport, and that's where the Canadian, the Canadian sent uh, um, a DC-3 uh, to pick up the refugees, and that's also quite a, a story because uh, it was an old DC-3, and uh, the, at the time there was, uh, there was a major storm in, in the whole North Atlantic, and so we had to go through um, the Azores, uh, but on the way from the Azores to Canada, um, one of the propellers cracked, so the, uh, the pilot was, he told us when we arrived in Gander, Newfoundland, in the biggest snowstorm, that uh, uh, he, theoretically he was supposed to put the plane down in the ocean, but because there were so many children on the plane, he knew that we would all perish if he did that, so he decided to keep going, so he did, I'm glad he did. <laughs> Any other? Yes, back. Yes. Okay. Your, your career as an author is, is, I believe, the most recent of many careers. And I'm wondering how it came about, how long have you been writing, and how do you find the time to produce so many books? Well, I, I've always been writing surreptitiously. I started out writing poetry when I was in high school, and then um, I uh, wrote the story of my own family's escape down for my own family so that my children and their children would have it and then showed it to a few people and they said I should try and get it published so I did and um, um, then I decided maybe I'll try my hand at uh, um, writing a thriller so I wrote Twisted Reasons which was my first thriller um, which was when we were living in Vienna uh, and I had more or less semi-retired from my previous career and I had time on my hands and uh, uh, did a lot of research and uh, delved into the uh, nuclear uh, arms uh, uh, situation between East and West and the uh, potential for um, some of that nuclear material from the former Soviet Union to get into the wrong hands. So that's really what it's about. Uh, it's a thriller, but a lot of fact went into it. Um, and then I um, thought, gee, I, I should write down these other two defection stories that happened. Uh, which could be interesting books. And along, this, along the way, I polished up some of, some of my poetry, so they got published. So it just happened that uh, I had more time on my hand and I was able to uh, regenerate some of the work I'd done before and get it published. So that's why this, this spring, I had actually three books come out. This was in March, uh, my latest poetry collection in April, Extinction, which they have out there, and Rainbow Vintner, a thriller about uh, uh, um, some bombings in Bordeaux, France, where we lived fairly recently with my fan, f f family, um, uh, which could, it, and the question is, is it jihadist terrorism or a right-wing right -wing coup? So I, I just have a lot of fun writing. It's how I spend my free time when Marsha, my wife, who's unfortunately not here because she had to do something else, uh, she, she gives me the f time off, I, that's what I do. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Yes, yes, I have a, a cousin I'm uh, quite close to who stayed there. And uh, her, f her father is the f one who first went to Canada. And this was at the end of the war. He, he left, uh, uh, he was on the um, um, western side of the demarcation line. And his wife's um, father got word to him that don't come back because the Soviets are taking all um, uh, able-bodied males and sending them to uh, uh, the, the gulags or else shooting them on the spot. So he, he um, didn't go back, left his, his wife with and young daughter, and uh, pregnant wife and young daughter there in Hungary. So this is the cousin that stayed there. Um, the, the son, the, the, the uh, one who was, the, the wife was pregnant with, actually ended up going to Canada, leaving the, the sister and mother behind. So these, these are sort of typical uh, refugee stories where families get torn asunder and but eventually some, some of them find happiness and do well and so I'm very grateful to the life Canada and the US and the West has given me. It's uh, been great. I certainly wouldn't be able to stand here in front of you having published 12 books and having had a lot of fun doing it. Yes? Would you hear the comment about 
Sure, I'll, I'll give you my take on it. It's uh, not pretty. It's a uh, um, pseudo-fascist or even fascist regime. Um, I think he's learned a lot from Vladimir Putin, who was best buddy, going back uh, some time, and uh, he's decided that he's going to emulate him. So basically, he controls uh, the media, he controls the judi judiciary, the uh, central bank, uh, uh, and, and all opposition is, is uh, 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 quieted and uh, not allowed to sort of bubble up. Uh, but he gives people enough there that they're not going to revolt. So he, 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 yeah, he has these uh, um, festivals every, every week in, in Budapest and you know, people come out and the drink is cheap and uh, the snacks are cheap, so he keeps them happy. When we were there when I was researching the book, and it seems like the young people who have no memory of the Soviet era are pretty much the memory of them. Yeah, that's probably true. They, yeah, they don't remember the... Uh, bad times. No, what, what happened in Hungary and, and in several other Eastern European countries, uh, most of them, uh, was that uh, during those terrible times, uh, during the war and the uh, post post war era, the, the, uh, if, the, um, well, I'll get, get on to that later, but uh, uh, the, the, the middle class, the intelligentsia was basically destroyed. So you ha you, what, you ha you, what you're left with in these countries is um, two opposing factions, the, the, the people who are sort of pseudo-communists and those who never uh, want to have anything to do with that. So, uh, and I guess it's sort of com becoming like that here, unfortunately. The <laughs> political divide is uh, escalating. Anyways, <coughs> any, any other questions? Yes? Sorry to be so No, no. I was seven, seven years old. Yeah, I was seven. I know the DC three that you flew out on. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that, um, yeah, no, I was seven then, long time ago. But it's it's what what I wrote down. It remained with me as sort of as a movie does with a child. It's as I remembered in in pictures and then eventually tried to articulate in a story and then built the historical context around it. Uh, and that's what became the book for, for the children. Yes? Just going back to the, uh, the book you were reading, out of all the various sports one could do, why fencing? What's well, the appeal of fencing? Well, uh, two things, two reasons. It's Hungary's national sport, so as a sort of new Hungarian refugee, uh, 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 I was attracted to it. And also it was offered in my high school and uh, the two combined. And, and, and what happened was that a lot of uh, excellent Hungarian coaches came out at the, in 56 as well, and they had nothing to do. So one of them came and taught at uh, uh, my high school, and uh, he was a former Olympian, and he sort of inspired me to uh, try and uh, do all these things. And continue fencing. So, yeah, I could have played hockey in Canada. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Much lighter question, but I was a little girl, and that was the first Olympics in Montreal that mm -hmm. I was aware of. Yeah. I was completely smitten by Nadia. Yes. And entranced by the possibility of defection, it really captured my imagination. I was wondering, did you get to meet her? Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you say anything about the Romanian gymnast server? Oh, I just said it's fa fabulous. She had, uh, I was there when she did one of, her, one of her 10 performances. And actually, uh, it's recorded in here, but uh, Paul was also there. And he, ca he, and I, he came over, and uh, we talked. And, uh, and uh, actually, he was uh, he, Bela Karoi, who's, who was the Romanian team's coach at the time, and later emigrated to Canada, or to the U.S., and became a g g gym, uh, gymnastics coach here. He, he and Paul knew each other, so I was introduced. Yeah. What's happened to Paul? Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, Is he alive and well? Yes, yes. Okay. It's a nice story. There, there's uh, some... There's some uh, I mean, there's... Uh, some tragedy, success, uh, 
happiness. Uh, um, it's sort of a typical refugee story where you know, he works hard and ends up doing well. But there's a lot of tragedy along the way. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that's partly why I wanted to re record it, is because it's, it's a nice story. And, and, he, and he, when I uh, launched the book in Toronto, uh, he came and he, he said uh, that that, uh, that was the best thing he ever did, and he's very thankful to Canada uh, for what uh, it gave him. Fadia, you had that? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, what are you going to write about next? Oh. <laughs> or what well, are you thinking about next? Well, I'm, I'm working uh, on a... On a uh, short story collection, uh, and I've got another volume of Extinction, po po uh, next poetry collection, uh, half done, and I'm thinking of uh, doing a sequel to my, um, actually I said Twisted Reasons was my first novel, but it wasn't. I, I, I e-published a book way back when, uh, Arctic Meltdown, which is very relevant now. I, I uh, uh, saw it coming, I guess. Uh, and I think it's time to do a sequel on that. Um, so that's sort of in the, in the conceptual stage at this point. And I've got a few other plans. But anyways, thank you everyone for coming and for listening to me. And <laughs> thank you.